Good morning. I'm Dr. Tony Liachan. I'm a health reform advocate. And my task for today is to discuss to you the COVID epidemic and what lessons have we learned after six months. I'd like to begin the discussion on the definition of flattening the curve. What are the global and current local data that we have? What reference models have we used? And what are the four pillars to reopen the economy? Are the vaccines the silver lining? And why do we fail in health and other initiatives? Flattening of the curve would mean that there are usually two curves that we need to understand. One, here in the y-axis, or the vertical axis would be the number of cases and the horizontal would be the time since the first case. The higher the curve would be higher acceleration and then there will be peaking and then deceleration if we will not do any protective measures. Our goal is to have a slower acceleration by actually doing some protective measures and then with gradual deceleration. This is done specifically so that our healthcare system capacity will not be overwhelmed. Thus, the higher the curve, it means higher acceleration. And of course, the greater will be the damage to that particular locality. Now, what if your loved one is this part of the curve and you have here a strict lockdown of cases? Our goal is basically to increase our healthcare capacity at this point in time. Now, with more time, we will buy more ventilators and open respiratory isolation wards that will also give us time to stockpile PPE and other medical supplies. That also will give us time to, to integrate telemedicine and do massive testings of our patients as well as contact tracings and then train the healthcare workers in order to address the hospitalized patients. And then we need to do a lot of workshops and learn from other colleagues and find the bright spots in the hot spots in other areas of the country. The current data would show that the number one country in the world with the most cases is the United States of America with 6 million cases and 186 deaths. But USA is actually on the deceleration phase, is on flattening the curve at this point in time. On second spot is actually Brazil with 3.8 million cases and 121,000 deaths. On third spot would be India. India is right now on an acceleration phase with 3.6 million cases and 64,000 deaths. The Philippines has the longest containment period in the world. And right now we're entering our six month with the different milestones and the different initiatives. What would be our comparison with the rest of the Southeast Asia? We're the number one country right now in terms of cases in the Southeast Asia, followed by Indonesia and then followed by Singapore. Comparing our the country with the different uh, countries in Southeast Asia. You can see here Cambodia starting off in March, but Cambodia has flattened the curve. And this is the curve of the Philippines. You see here from January to February with a little plateauing, but because of the Cebu surge and the surge in the national capital region, then we have a stepladder epidemic curve. Malaysia has also flattened the curve 
vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines. And then you have Myanmar. Myanmar has also flattened the curve versus the Philippine epidemic curve. There are only two countries in Asia which have not have flattened the curve, and that is the Philippines and Indonesia. In this next slide, you will see that Singapore has a unique curve. After controlling the situation, you have here peaking and then deceleration. When they opened the borders to migrant worker, there was a surge, but they were able to control it, leading to a deceleration. And here is the Philippine epidemic curve. Vietnam is one of the best reference models in the world, and they were able to flatten the curve with almost zero mortality, except for uh, some reopening of the borders leading to about 10 deaths. But Vietnam has been considered one of the best reference models in terms of flattening the curve. Thailand is another good reference model. They have flattened the curve um, when they started in February, they flattened the curve sometime in March. This is the current situation in the Philippines right now. With a few index cases on February, we, have, we had only three cases. And then in March, 2,000 cases. April, we had 8,000 cases. May, 18,000. June, 37,000. And July, we had only 31,000. But our situation actually worsened this uh, particular time when we had an increase in the cases in the Philippines, to about 220,000 cases. So as you can see, if you will add up everything here, the sum of all the cases from uh, February to July would be around uh, uh, 90,000. But here, just in July, you can see that we actually had more than 100,000 cases. And August is really um, a bad month for us. And this is actually uh, seen in this particular, uh, particular chart. Now, we have also... Uh, 4,000 cases uh, on the average daily uh, on the month of March. And you can see here, based on our projection, that we might actually be reaching more in the next uh, few weeks unless we can radically uh, implement the healthcare capacities to be in place, that is testing, contact tracing, and isolation and quarantine. In July, the critical care capacity of the different hospitals uh, was rich. And at this point in time, we have problems regarding the capacity, the bed capacity, the ICU, and the mechanical ventilators of the different hospitals. Now, this one is a nice slide showing us here that um, when, uh, when Cebu City was in crisis sometime in, in mid-June, the IATF mandated ECQ for almost uh, four weeks and then MECQ for two weeks. You see here a gradual reduction of the ICU bed occupancy rate. And in contrast with the national capital region during the time when there was a surge in Cebu, there has been a gradual increase in the ICU bed occupancy rate together with the contiguous area that is in Region 4. Now, since we have not seen a pandemic in our lifetime, when I was PCP uh, president in 2015, I was able to review the Ebola experience and based on the template, the first one that we need to understand 
is we need to slow down the virus. We need to take swift action to temporarily ban public gatherings, close schools, and ask the residents to stay at home. They were able to prevent the virus spread uh, from the uh, rural to the urban area. And since we are dealing with an invincible enemy, massive testing should be done, rapidly scaling up testing, and bring it as close as possible to the residents' homes. And it's just like uh, looking for a needle in the haystack with your eyes closed, so that it is really an imperative to do massive testings, about 3 to 10% of the population. We need to understand that we need to protect the healthcare workers at all costs. The who will provide care for the sick and then repurpose the arms of the government. And that is the uniform personnel to support the epidemic response, to urgently deliver PPEs and other medical supplies. Once all the health measures have been undertaken, that is the plan right now for the economy to open. Now, there are two good countries that we can use as reference models, and that's basically Vietnam and New Zealand. And basically, they were successful because of the following reasons. They had quick coordinated response. Nationwide lockdowns were done, but they were only very short. In fact, Vietnam had only 21 days of lockdown. There was massive and meticulous uh, contact tracing. There was a strict enforcement and restrictions in movement down, done by uniform personnel. And lastly, but I think the most important, they exhibited exceptional leadership and governance in times of crisis. South Korea has been a favorite reference model of mine. Without the benefit of the lockdown, they intervened quickly before it was too late. They actually installed or established the touch testing center. They tested early, often, and then safely. And then they established contact tracing, plus isolation facilities, quarantine facilities, and did surveillance studies, and used also digital technology to actually do contact tracing. And lastly, and I think one of the most important things that we need to understand that in terms of doing crisis management, enlisting public health, that is recruitment of medical experts, um, epidemiologists, uh, data analytics, and the business sector would be a great help in order to address the crisis. When I was uh, a member of the National Task Force, on my third day, I presented this particular concept, the hammer and dance concept. This was published by well-known social writer, Thomas Pueyo. And it's basically about suppression versus mitigation versus doing nothing. If you will do nothing, you will have a steep curve. But when we do mitigation, we will actually do suppression or, or mitigation uh, and, of course, reduction of the cases. Now, you need to understand that during this particular lockdown, you need to do massive public health education. You cut down the virus growth, understand the cases, recruit a lot of personnel, and improve all the treatment options and get the proper testing and tracing, basically to put the healthcare capacity in place during this time. Now, it would last from three to seven weeks. Now, once you are on the deceleration phase, and once the R0 is less than one, then you can actually dance with the economy. And this is the hammer and dance concept. But we need to be resilient as well as relentless in, in trying to maintain the healthcare capacity during this time as we reopen the economy because we want to prevent a second wave or a surge because of mobility. So we need to understand the basic guidelines during the reopening of the economy. 
perhaps you need to understand the definition of the area classification and the, and the quarantine and the different intervention. When we mean ECQ, that is enhanced community quarantine, it means no movement regardless of age and health status, minimal economic activity except for utility services, food, power, water, and of course, the critical economic sector. No transportation except for utility services and suspension of classes is a mandate. Now, when you mean modified ECQ, you have limited movement within the zone, plus operation of selected manufacturing and processing plants up to 50%. And then you have limited transport services for essential services and goods. Again, there will be suspension of classes. When you mean GCQ or general community quarantine, it means limited movement to services. And the operation of government and industries will be up to a maximum 75%. There will be opening of public transport, and this will actually cause some problems in terms of surges because of the social distancing measure that will be actually be negated at this point in time. And then the DepEd will actually implement flexible learning arrangement and will be operating on a modular basis. And then the modified GCQ, you have permissive socioeconomic activities with minimum public health standards. We have a plan actually, but I don't think it has been properly articulated by the government. We need to continuously inform the public. When we inform the public, we will be able to influence and inspire people. We need to do a massive preventive health education campaign. We need to do a lot of tracing. We need to do RT-PCR and all of this, these things per LGU. We need to construct a lot of isolation facilities. And then we need also to understand that we need to support also the healthcare workers in the hospitals. Once all of these measures are done or management system done, then we will be able to reintegrate the society and then transition them into the new normal. The government last month appointed four lead leaders or SARS, Dr. Vince Dison, the testing SAR. You have Mayor Benji Magalong from Baguio City, a former intelligence chief of the Philippine National Police, the contact tracing SAR, the hero of the Cebu City success. You have Secretary Mark Villar, the isolation facility czar, and then the very diligent and very reliable Under Secretary Leopoldo Vega from Mindanao. He is the current treatment czar of the National Task Force. Now, during the time of the first surge in January, February, the government tested only those with strong symptoms, those uh, particularly the healthcare workers and those working in crowded places. But right now, the mandate is to test everybody and test everybody every week so that we'll be able to understand the magnitude of the problem. And we need to understand that we cannot flatten the curve unless the four pillars to control COVID crisis are in place. We need to test. We need to ask the question, who is infected? We need to trace who are those in contact with the infected person. We need to isolate. We need to prevent those infected from transmitting the disease. And lastly, we need to quarantine, prevent the contacts from infecting others. These are the essential four pillars in order to flatten the curve. And the other countries in Southeast Asia which have flattened the curve are actually have perfected these particular initiatives. Now, of course, you heard about the University of the Philippines OCTA research team led by Professor Guido David and Professor Ranjik Singh of the University of the Philippines. 
these are the latest data that was actually forwarded to the interagency task force and the national task force so they could come up with new quarantine guidelines the r naught or r0 is a mathematical term that indicates how contagious an infectious disease is and ro tells the average number of people who will contract a contagious disease from an infected person thus if r naught is less than one each existing infection causes less than one infection and in this case the disease will decline and eventually die out when we mean r naught would equal to one each existing infection causes only one new infection the disease will stay alive and be stable but there won't be an outbreak or an epidemic and lastly if r naught is more than one each existing infection causes more than one infection and the disease will be transmitted between people and there may be an outbreak or an epidemic we need to understand this particular concept so that we will be able to advise the iatf and of course the other agency and the whole citizenry the philippines has a reproductive number at this point that is almost one from uh, 1.49 last july 16 to 22 it has gone down to 1.03 the philippines number of new cases per day has decreased from 4300 august 12 to 18 and because of the mecq the cases have been slightly reduced and perhaps this is secondary to the gains of the mecq the projections for September 30, if we will use the GCQ, then we will have a lower projection of 330,000, a median projection of 350,000, and of course, a higher projection of 375,000, just in case the healthcare capacities will not be in place and the social distancing guidelines will not be followed by the people. The national capital region is the heart of the country it has around 12 percent of the country's population basically about 12 billion and contributes to about a third of the annual gross domestic product and thus it is the epicenter of the country's pandemic contributing 55 to 60 percent of the total number of cases to date the daily cases in the national capital region because of the mecq has gone down from 2,684 to 2,192. And the R0 has decreased below 1. And this has been because of the implementation of the MECQ. But we're not yet out of the woods yet. And we should not declare victory too soon. The NCR positivity rate decreased to 14%. The WHO benchmark is less than 5%. There's still transmission, local transmission, and we need to work harder to reduce the positivity rate to around 5%. The hospital ICU occupancy in the national capital region, as you can see here, nine LGUs are at critical level, and these are the city of Pontinlupa, Marikina, Valenzuela, Taguig City, Las Piñas, the city of Mandaluyong, Quezon City, the city of Makati. And then those who are doing well at this point in time, less than 70%. City of Pasig, Pateros, Pasay City, Caloocan, and then Paranaque. The projections for the national capital region, we hope that we can actually have only 180,000 by the end of the month because this would cause some problems in our economy particularly our gdp now is the vaccine the silver lining for disclosure i was past medical director of pfizer i worked for pfizer from 1993 to 2010 and one of the products that we've launched is actually a vaccine 
that is a prebinar. So I have extensive pharmaceutical and regulatory affairs uh, experience in this aspect. Now, of course, we know that we need to, to do clinical trials. We need to do phase one, phase two, and phase three. And some of the products that we have right now uh, are on phase three and they're on track. And these are AstraZeneca, you have Moderna, you have um, uh, Pfizer Biotech that is from, uh, from Germany, and, and three Chinese uh, compounds. Now, this will have facilitated US FDA approval, and hopefully, they will be approved sometime in December so that they can be launched uh, during the first quarter of next year and be given in the second quarter to a lot of people in the Philippines. According to the WHO list, on August 13, there are 29 vaccines in the clinical evaluation stage, where at least phase one clinical trials have begun. Now, out of this, the following six candidates are actually on track for phase three. The University of Oxford AstraZeneca from the UK, the vaccine co-developed by Moderna, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in the United States, uh, Pfizer Biotech from the US, and four uh, vaccines coming from China. The Chinese vaccine maker Sinovac, the Wuhan Institute, and the Beijing Institute in China. Now, according to the Department of Science and Technology, the COVID-19 vaccine would likely be available by the second quarter of 2021. And the clinical trials in the Philippines will be starting fourth uh, quarter of this year, sometime in October. Now, if the results are good, the local FDA will review it for approval, then the public will have access to it by the second quarter of 2021. But boxes are not, uh, are not silver bullets. We need to understand that healthcare capacity should be enhanced and should be in place. That is testing, isolation, contact tracings, and quarantine. And this will be our future for at least in the next two or three years. Now, the reasons why we fail in health and other endeavors, I'd like you to, to read this particular book by Dr. Atul Gawande a cardiothoracic surgeon from, from Harvard. And he said that these are the following reasons why we fail in health and in other endeavors. The first is ignorance. So, so education is key. And then ineptitude. Knowledge is there, but we fail to comply correctly. Lack of blueprint for change. And then leadership and governance problems. In one particular article by famous uh, uh, columnist Bu Chanko, he said that LGUs will be very important to the healthcare system. In the face of the national government's failure to have an adequate COVID-2019 response, a number of LGUs have stepped up to the plate. And these are Marikina Mayor Marcy Chodoro, Valenzuela Mayor Rex Gachalian, uh, Mayor Vico Soto, Mayor Isco Moreno, um, some other governors, and of course, Baguio City's Mayor Benji Magalo uh, pretty much kept the city COVID free for a long time. And he's right now the contact czar of the Philippines. Now, according to former Secretary of Health, Dr. Manolet Dairit, now uh, former Dean also of the Ateneo Graduate School of Business. He pointed out that the role of LGUs cannot be overemphasized in managing the epidemic. He would actually place the responsibility on the LGUs, and we need to understand that also moving forward, the local government unit will be at the forefront of enforcing social distancing rules, wearing face masks and face shields, and monitoring the health conditions in the densely populated communities particularly in the national capital region. And this emergency will most likely occupy their attention even beyond 2022. 
Now, another book that I'd like to read is The Switch. It's a classic uh, book on how to change things when changed at heart by the, by the Heat Brothers. Basically, we need to have a good leader. A good leader that we can direct who will follow the bright spots, the best practices in the Philippines or other areas or other countries in Southeast Asia. A good leader or a writer that is actually script the critical moves and point to the destination. This particular writer or leader should be able to motivate the elephant. The elephant is actually the population the people we need to find the feeling to inspire and motivate the elephant we need to shrink the changes we need to understand that we need to grow people as well we sh they should not be, be blamed for all these problems because i think we need to do a lot of campaign in terms of um, messaging very important that we need to connect to the public but we need to have a blueprint. The rider or the leader and the elephant or the population will only walk, walk in if there's a path uh, being directed to them. Then we need to tweak the environment and build healthy habits. And we need to constantly rally the herd and motivate the elephant so that we can actually control the viral transmission. Of course, it is important to understand that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. And based on the study of Dance et al. this year, face pass and face shield would have a 93% reduction, uh, risk reduction. One meter distance plus face mask, 94% reduction. Two meters distance plus face mask would result in 97% estimated risk reduction. And one meter at least, face mask and face shield will lead to 99% risk reduction of contracting COVID-19. So ladies and gentlemen, this is very important. And perhaps we need to embrace this particular advocacy so that we can actually rally the herd and motivate the people. And we need to step up to the plate to help our government at this point in time. So we need also the doctors to step up. We need to inspire the civil society. The word doctors comes from the Latin word docere, which means to teach. So we need to teach. We need to tell people that we can control the viral transmission. We need to heal. And we need to lead our leaders as well. As doctors, we need to recognize the problem. There's a huge elephant in the room right now. But sometimes we tend to ignore that huge elephant. And we need to understand that the economy will never recover as long as the virus is not controlled. And if we don't understand it, then we are part of the problem. Is the money the solution? An important metaphor is that the country is in the ICU. Now, do we need to transfer a patient to the regular room instead of retaining the patient in the ICU because we don't have much funds? I think we need to find the cure to our problems like testing, isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine and then find a way of found out funding that particular cure. And this is the only way that we can reopen our economy. So this is the 12-point long-term plan for COVID-19 by the National Task Force. And based on the WH criteria, these are the measures that should be done. We need to understand that before we leave the quarantine, viral transmission is controlled. The health system capacities are in place to detect, test, isolate, and treat every case and every contact. Outbreak risks are minimized in health facilities and nursing homes. Preventive measures are in place in workplaces and in schools. 
importation risk can be managed to OFWs and overseas Filipinos. And then we need to fully educate, engage, and empower to adjust the Filipino to the new normal system. We need to do a lot of massive testing, targeted and focused, to diagnose both the sick and the healthy. We need to establish isolation and quarantine facilities in the local government unit. And then we need to create COVID hospitals in each of the locality so that we'll be able to admit patients who are also non-COVID. We need to manage the overseas contract workers to prevent the second wave of infection and prepare for the rainy season from June to December because we know that we are being battered by typhoons 22 times a year. And this will also be the time then we will have a lot of dengue, flu, and of course, pneumonia. We need to enlist the best and the brightest health leaders, academicians, advocates in the entire medical community. We need to partner with the business sector. We need to prepare the country to transition to the new normal, to a strategic communication plan. And we need to generate real time and more granular data with zero backlogs and rapid turnaround time. And we need also a monitoring and evaluation system with a clear metric of success. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. I'm very hopeful that we can flatten the curve in the next 100 days, but we need to step up. We need to model the way. We need to inspire a shared vision. We need to challenge the process and we need to enable others to act and encourage the heart and motivate the people. I'd like to quote in closing Dumbledore from the Harry Potter movie. Happiness can be found even in the darkest of times if one only remembers to turn on the light. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.